Phantoloids Podcast, here to tell you that we've teamed up with Vault Comics to help bring some of their creators a spotlight. Vault Comics, based out of Missoula, Montana, have been bringing some of the best fantasy, sci-fi, and horror comics to print since 2016. We're getting the chance to read some of their series early, and we're getting to discuss with the creative team the vision for their series. We're very happy to be collaborating with Vault Comics and sharing these number ones with you. Welcome to Exploring the Vault. Cue the intro. podcast kyle here with pierre and ben hennessy. ben hennessy a very special guest first thank you for being here thank i appreciate you, you taking you the guys. time i know there's a time difference i know it's a little bit later i know we're a little bit more awake ah, but no just to get right into it tell us about yourself tell us everything so it all started about 37 years ago when i was born and um, no nah, right back that far i'm an artist i've been working in the animation student industry for the last like 16 years wow. and i've been about 14 years knocking on the comic book industry door and finally someone answered like a is Christopher Sabella. He put out one of those kind of tweets that no one ever really responds to, you know, looking for an artist, but he actually responded to it and he kind of let me in the industry. So I've been working with him on our comic book, Godfell. That's going to come out on 22nd of February. I've kind of been keeping both feet in both industries at the moment, a little bit in animation and a little bit in comics. And we'll see how things go either one, see if one foot comes out of the other. But uh, I'm freelancing, so I'm quite happy working in both. If one gets a bit quieter, the other one tends to be pretty noisy. And I've kind of always wanted to work in both so it's really it's really satisfying getting to scratch both those things and kind of just filling up my time with animation in preschool animation for adults and comic books in for adults as well it's been a real real joy to actually get into comics to not just work on on a book i really like but to also work on a fantasy book because i really like the fantasy genre it's been a lot of fun and it's been really kind of interesting navigating that fantasy genre with chris because it's not a genre he likes it's kind of funny because I think he writes a really good fantasy book. Mm. So he's not really so interested. It's fun seeing how he kind of navigates that for himself. This book obviously introduced us to you and did a fantastic job on it. We're going to get into it more in a little bit, but got to look into your animation stuff as well now because, you know, now we're super big fans. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Thanks, guys. There's a lot of preschool. I don't know if you'd be into watching that kind of stuff unless you have a kid kind of around the gaff. But not yet. Don't rush us. All right. <laughs> really, really happy with the stuff I got to work on. There's one over there that's really big over there that we haven't mm. seen over here outside of Amazon. It's um, Pink Alicious and Peter Riffick. Mm. I've been on that like, since like season one for it's a PDF. Oh, okay. so that's been great because like, the team we've worked with is a Belfast studio and like they've got like work out of a program that you just shouldn't be able to get that level of animation from. I'm a storyboard artist so like uh, generally when I get like these ambitious scripts I go all right I'm going to storyboard this for you but I wonder what you'll really do you know when I get to see what I am put together and then mm. when I actually got to see the episodes it's like wow not only did they animate what I drew them they kind of embellish it further it's really cool oh. that's awesome the little things we definitely didn't know about you at all I kind of know them right I mean uh, it's uh, I that in my research <laughs> <laughs> it's like you guys kind of coming up even with the podcast that I was doing when we were kind of chatting off camera and stuff like that's very new to me so like the fact you guys were even kind of talking about it was like these guys are really doing their work I don't know what to do we're gonna have to everyone check out Pinkalicious and Peter <laughs> you gotta check that out everyone when you have a kid it's time to check that one. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so it sounds like you basically do this all day, right? I mean, yeah, how would you no, describe no. your routine? Like, how often do you draw? How many hours? So, like, at the moment, it's kind of embarrassing as to how much I'm actually working. Usually, it's a bit healthier. <laughs> like, again, I was 15, whatever many years, knocking on the comic book industry door. Fucking pandemic happens. So, usually, it's in like eight to five, and then I kind of stop. But at the moment, I'm doing two books in the podcast. So, it's eight to five. I stop for dinner see the family get the daughter to bed see the wife for a little bit and then I clock back in usually around half eight nine and if it's a good day I stop at 11 and if it's not it could be one or two and I kind of stop there's more research on podcasts than I expected to have to do I wasn't expecting for having waited so long to get into comic books that then two jobs that came around at the same time and I love post-apocalyptic stuff as well that's what the other books mm. all about it's a post-apocalyptic kind of story I haven't seen anyone kind of take this way before so it's been a blast i kind of wanted both of them so i've done this to myself and i'm the reason why i'm working so much at the moment it can be long days most of it's drawing at the moment there's a little bit of researching on other podcasts 
podcasts that we do as well. And the podcast I do is called The Odds Pod. It's kind of there to help publicize the other book I'm doing, The Odds. It's coming out with Scout Comics. And I'm aiming to finish drawing that like end of this year or so. It'll come out soon around then. Okay, um, so that's when I'll reach out. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, the writer on that is actually is my mate, Dave Hendrick. He's the co-host on The Odds Pod as well. Yeah, we'll get a copy to you when we have that kind of sorted. And we can let us know what you think. How many episodes deep are you on the podcast? I don't think we're even 20 episodes. We, we've okay. kind of ramped up our number a little bit more recently because we do a companion pod for the HBO Last of Us show. Oh, very nice. Okay. And then that's having us do it a bit more often. And it's kind of like having myself and Dave talk amongst ourselves a bit more because usually we bring on a guest and we grill them. You know, we let them do mm-hmm. all of it. But the whole idea is that because our comic is about apocalypse, we ask our guests what's their favorite apocalypse. So we've gotten mm-hmm. answers not what you'd expect. It's been very different. There's been people picking ending a book of characters that they'll never get a chance to work on or write again to you know your zombie apocalypse to America's actual response to an apocalyptic situation which was like I mean it felt like the best spoof you've never heard of and it's real you know really wanted to do all these things and it's kind of funny they've all come now at the same time so I would say post-apocalyptic's probably my top yeah. and then just general sci-fi and then fantasy so you're hitting all the nails here <laughs> excellent excellent <laughs> you have to play all the books that work on please please in terms of any like fantasy recommendations like books comics TV fantasy and pretty like well, Jesus a lot there's a lot of good stuff I'm on like my third listen through of the Demon Cycle series by Peter V. Brett have you guys ever heard of that but I'll talk about that for a second because like I want more people to read these because I'd love to talk about it with more people it's, <laughs> it's a brilliant series and he's starting a new trilogy called Twilight Princess I think it's called but um, the initial like five books I think is about a boy called Arlen Bales and you find out that he hasn't like spent more than 12 hours away from home whether it be by horse or whether it be by foot because he has to get home before it gets dark because that's when all these demons come out mm. and uh, they can't do anything to fight these demons they can put down these wards to kind of make safe houses and stay in them and they have to hope that the wards hold up while they beat and scratch and blow fire on these things and it's a brilliant story if you haven't got into that check it out they did a radio show I think on Audible as well but oh yeah okay the Red Steven Cycle is amazing I'm big on the audiobooks like early in the morning like that's yeah. like my little routine I'll try and get like a half hour hour in yeah, yeah, yeah. that sounds cool yeah I'll send you a link to it afterwards make sure you get the right one yeah definitely yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that's pretty cool because it gives you a chance to kind of create your own, I guess, vision of what these characters look like just based off of like the sound that you're getting from the stories and whatnot, right? Yeah, I guess yeah. when you just watch a TV show, a movie, you're given what you're given, but I feel like you can draw a lot of things from just listening to books and things like that. Absolutely. Like, and I'm a bit like kind of particular about my designs and being true to the writer's intentions on the characters. So like if the writers describe something about how they look, what they wear, how they move, I make sure I have all that in my stuff. So like I might not have captured that or pay attention to that the first time around but when it comes to actually drawing these things even if it's just for fun like I get caught up in making sure that I nail it that I have to have that little thing that he had or like Arlen Bales he's really good at drawing wards and protect things like so yeah, I did a little sketch of him once and I made sure he had a satchel and a pen and stuff or whatever and it was just yeah I kind of almost sucked the joy out of it because I get straight back into making sure I land this professional rendering of this character as described by the book as possible that's my sickness and I like it you know I like that I'm not kind of fantasy one like is I just saw a cover I did for Barbaric on the whatnot I kind of had forgotten about it I'd drawn it for ages ago and like just on the note of like someone being kind of particular that kind of stuff like you uh, talking about the artist like Nathan Good and stuff on anything I will read it's all his work on Barbaric another kind of fantasy book I'd recommend it kind of sounds like I'm towing the company line here like talking about it no, that's book, good. but like Nathan Good is brilliant you know I'd recommend him a million times let's go right into the synopsis for Godfell you generously let us read not only issue one but issue two we're going to mm-hmm. not spoil anything unless you spoil it yourself. But Pierre, I think you could agree with me. We absolutely loved issue one. Absolutely Thank loved you. issue two. Thank you. There's so much detail in the panels, the character designs. I can't compliment it enough. I have a specific kind of art type that I see myself drawn to. Nice. Clean, but gritty at the same time. Fantastic. And it fits the story just perfectly. Now that I've complimented you just a little bit. <laughs> Thanks very much. If you want to give the synopsis and tell your experience with it. Cool. So the synopsis is that God 
God has fallen to the earth dead and it has had a huge ramification on everyone living there. It has destroyed places where it lives, kind of made this massive tidal wave of earth like roll out from its impact. It's been a real natural disaster of a sort. But all while this is happening, there's two factions in the land of Carathon, which is where the God falls, at war with one another. And one of the soldiers from war is Zanzi. And Zanzi is this force of nature. One battles all on her own. She's soldier turned up to 11. She gets to the point where she's basically single-handedly won the war. It's time for her to go home now, see her family. Did she get brought back in and told, actually, you know what? All you guys, you're going to go to another war in this other place we have to go to. And she's unhappy with that. So she abandons the army and she decides to go home. And on the way home, there's a companion of inconvenience. She finds someone who she doesn't really want to be around. And they end up kind of palling with each other as they make their way towards the god. And Zanzi doesn't really believe the god, but this net character she's just kind of picked up along the way it does. And when they get to the village to see the god, they realize this god is massive, absolutely huge. And the quickest way for Zanzi to get home is to pretty much go through the body. Going around the god, that's not an option for her. She doesn't go around anything. She goes through everything. And that's what they do. They start at the foot and you find that there's different people living in and on the god's corpse. And Zanzi and Neth kind of have to engage, do battle with all these things that are living in. And I say things because it's not just people. There's all kinds of monsters. And because this is a fantasy, I've really leaned into that fantasy element where I can kind of design silly chimera monsters. A horrible looking bacteria tapeworm uh, referenced a Hercules maggot and a tapeworm for one of the monsters. It's been fun playing with that stuff but all these things exist inside the god's body and they're all threats and Sandy is going to cut her way through all these threats just to make sure she gets home. And how many issues? Six issues. Um, okay. They're fairly long. I mean like the first issue is 30 pages and every issue after that is 26 so you're going to get bang for your buck out of this. You know it's nearly seven issues I think on count. At the very least you know you'll get your money's worth guys. Go check yeah. it out. And this comes out on what date again? The 22nd of February. For anyone listening who's from Ireland I'm doing a signing in the Big Bang and Dundrum on the 25th and we'll launch the book there and I'll have a couple of things to give away on the day as well. I'd love to come out there but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been? Oh yeah, I love New York. I've never been to New Jersey, but I love New York. I've been there a few times. Any You're not conventions? Anything over here? Yeah, I've been to New York Comic Con. Never as an artist. We probably bumped into each other. Didn't even know it. Very possible. Very possible. <laughs> I was probably that guy in your way in that queue. You know. I think I'm the one in everyone's way. <laughs> <laughs> now you finally made it. You're behind the desk now. <laughs> what really goes into creating a new world? Because that's what you're essentially doing here, right? A whole landscape that you guys have decided to make. How did this come about? What it goes into the design process a lot more than i thought i would put aside for as well but again kind of showing my background in animation there's different departments for all these things as a storyboarder i get character designs and i get backgrounds and i get asset sheets so i know how to draw all these things from various angles and what they're supposed to look like but put it on screen i'm not like drawing something too small or too big i kind of put that into godfell when i got a script i was making sure i handled the character designs then i get some kind of idea of the background knowing that they were going to cross fast backgrounds I wasn't really putting as much of a push on finishing my backgrounds and with my character designs because I'm going to have to get good at drawing these characters because I'm going to draw them a lot and I can get away with backgrounds more so than characters on this because everyone, everyone's going to look at the characters and everyone's going to look at the characters eyes because everyone wants to know what the characters are feeling right eyes are the window to the soul so lots of effort characters and make sure that they're set properly the backgrounds then like myself and Chris we have a lot of Zoom calls every issue we kind of get an idea to what one particular part of the world would feel like comparison to another desert landscape versus a lush forest versus you know a place where dragons are flying by in the background that kind of stuff and then more for every part of the god body that our characters go through so the flesh hotels that exist in the leg the the sensates that live in the pelvis they don't have that kind of living they live in something a bit nicer and they kind of look a little bit kind of at the grander things in life and then the pilgrims who go to the lungs and the hearts it's a very different area as well so each thing has to look and feel and almost smell like it's a different place. Wait till you see the intestines and like the people that live there and stuff. It's a very different thing as well, you know? But like, it's been easy to kind of mess up with Chris. We've been able to kind of get on the same page very quickly. I think even from the very beginning, like he had been working on these characters with Raven Smith before I came on board. They had a really good idea as to who they were. When I was first talking to him, he had a line for Zanzi. I think I might even just said it there. He calls Zanzi a force of nature. 
relationship. And I think when I was trying to come up with her, I wrote that down in the middle of the model sheet. And I made sure that was always my intent to make sure that she looked like a force of nature. Then everything that she used and everything around her had to make her look like a force of nature. I didn't realize that until I was working on some kind of steed for her to travel this world. A horse didn't really seem to cut it for me. I even looked at like really nice big muscly horses for this absolute <laughs> tank of a warrior and they still didn't really do it and I felt like I'd seen it before. And then it kind of clicked with me that I could make up an animal. So I came up with these horse bulls that myself and Chris are calling horribles because they're the animal of choice by the army. People are terrified of them. They run over people when they need to. They're kind of big fierce creatures but it looked like something that could carry a Zanzi very well the battle yeah. area. So I went with that and then kind of from that everything kind of steamrolled. But I made a platypus buffalo for Neth to be riding around on, you know, and there's cat monkeys. When I first saw it on the cover and just some of the like pages, I was like, a bull. But then mm. I'm like looking at the body and like the design, right? You don't realize it at first, but it's obviously a horse and a bull. And there you go right, right there. The legs are different. The tail is different. You see like the muscles on the side. I was like, you went into just even that, you know, that small detail. Four different kinds of bulls, a Spanish fighting bulls, horn a Belgian blue body because like, I didn't realize it like but those Belgian blue bulls must be like just blasting their lats every day in the gym they're like super muscly you know it's ridiculous so I kind of put them together but like nothing as noble as a horse as a steed so I needed a bit of a horse in there as well but my overall idea was to like Sansi's massive I want to make a massive steed and I thought I'll make it as big as a moose and then when I, in practice I realized this doesn't work that looks fucking ridiculous <laughs> so I got to tail it back a bit and make it look more like a horse but yeah that was kind of the trick with that and a lot of fun kind of come up with these guys because as a storyboarder all the design work is usually done for me so I've had since as character designer and background but to kind of get a chance to do it all here with Godfell I have really grabbed that opportunity and I'm trying to do as much of it as I can yeah there you go that was me trying to make it as big as a modern day moose and then I realized that's this terrible idea <laughs> it's super cool and this was early Sansi design like where you can see I was pretty influenced by Wayne Reynolds you know the guy who does all the does the dragon and Pathfinder art and I was putting the eyes on pretty much every part of her massive axes and that was the first thing I cut out when I realized I can have to draw this person about five times a page <laughs> it's just uh, no we'll give him one axe maybe a knife down or shoot and no one will see a whole lot yeah, so these yeah, animals are so my cool. favorite thanks I kind of want a tattoo of one of them <laughs> oh, cool. the cat monkey I think is my number one but the deer fox is very close I've ripped off that deer fox okay <laughs> my, my daughter is a massive fan of the Hilda series do you always watch that the Luke Pearson Hilda books or anything it's brilliant and uh, like the main character Hill that has like a little deer fox so uh, I was kind of playing okay. with my daughter one day she said my lap while I was drawn and uh, we kind of did my version of Twig or deer fox like I did a an indie book called Carrie and Rufus which is kind of like Shaun of the Dead meets Turner and Hooch where a character bumped into a talking fox so I kind of made mostly my fox Rufus and just took some horns on it you know and some deer legs I'd love to put that in and hope to God Luke Pearson doesn't decide to sue me <laughs> <laughs> you're a D&D fan owl bears are a thing so I thought I'd just go with eagle bear instead the eagle bear is cool. I really like the cat monkey though. And the rat pigeon yeah. is just so fitting. <laughs> it's funny that you said that you like the deer fox and the cat monkey. I actually do like the rat pigeon and the eagle bear. Those are my okay. favorite. Yeah. We'll get tattooed together. <laughs> there we go. I want pictures. I want to see that. That'd be cool. <laughs> this is great. Yes. When this was... came on, the, I was going to say the screen. I can see this as a movie at this point, really. Like as I'm reading it, I'm like, yeah. this would be just so cool to see. That would be awesome. After 16 years of like trying to get into the comics and then a comic becoming a series. Yeah, that'd be dream made thanks very much imagine that a platypus ox just walking towards you like such a cool design and then you ride it yeah and then you ride it there's just people talking on top of it it's great <laughs> so i guess zanzi came first i'm assuming that's the first thing you drew out of this whole thing yeah yeah she was the first because she was the character myself and chris talked about first you know and then kind of net came after we kind of established who she was going to be and god i went through so many kind of ideas on her and nothing really landed until it kind of broke down who she was after her conversation and I made sure I had force of nature on the page all the time it's still there but like when I kind of saw Serena Williams I kind of thought that's it that's the athleticism Zanzi needs because I remember I'm a big MMA fan and I remember watching Brock Lesnar and Frank Mir the first time they fought and I was just amazed at how fast Brock Lesnar could move despite the fact he was like three times the size of Frank Mir who was already a big muscly man you know mm -hmm. and I kind of wanted that to kind 
come across with Zanzi. You know, she's huge, but like she's fast. I just wanted her to have every attribute a warrior could have, you know. And I kind of wanted her to be kind of scary looking and kind of a few scars in the face kind of bring that bit home. Great design. Thanks very much. And then, of course, Neth too. I mean, the two of them side by side is just a perfect combination. Thanks. I, I kind of want her to almost be the opposite, where Zanzi is mm-hmm. massive and intimidating. Neth is, and um, Chris described her as a living ghost, so I put that down. And I kind of wanted her to almost hide behind her hair at times, mm-hmm. where Zanzi would be shoulders broad, and Neth would be shoulders kind of curved in, and she'd hide behind her hair, hands almost under her face every time. And it just really kind of quiet. And when Chris kind of said living ghost, I don't know why it occurred to me to do it this way, but I wanted her to have like white hair so she'd almost look like a ghost. As he described the character, I'm like, oh yeah, you know what? For that plot point down the road, she's definitely getting white hair. Like I think I might have had it in there. Like, due to her history, her hair has gone completely white. Yeah. That's very cool. And then you see here just how small she is in comparison to Zanzi. Just This is me next to most people. <laughs> Which one are you, Zanzi or Ned? Well, let's go with the height nice. of Ned, but maybe a little <laughs> oh, bit. They're going to say the height of Zanzi. <laughs> no, short, but a little bulky. Both characters, fantastic, great dynamic, and your designs obviously push them even farther. And then this design, the god itself, the fact that he looks almost alien, and yeah. it's just so unique. Also, super cool design. And glad you said unique, because that was really something we wanted to do. We didn't want something that people had seen before, and we also needed it to be something that like people could traverse inside and on. It needed to be a biped really and then kind of thinking about that you're kind of looking at like other gods and how they're worshipped or how they're framed by their certain religions and you know Christ on the cross was an easy one to kind of reference but I didn't want to do that crucifixion pose I needed something else and I didn't want to do a kind of a starfish pose because it's kind of boring like I know when a body lands in the ground that's probably what it's going to be but there was also like you know conversations with me and Chris where we were like the god will land the ground and he'll be completely mangled bone sticking out of this part of him and you know like almost immediately I realized well, that's not going to work. That's several problems. This kind of set together, having the legs kind of crossed at the end, if Zanzi and Ned needed to go left and go around her part of the body, it kind of gave us opportunity to explore that part. And you'll kind of see later on, I don't want to say anything that's going to spoil it, but like you'll kind of see that just like other religions, people who are worshipping this, like this image is transposed onto the idols of some type and tattoos and all kinds of stuff. So the pose itself had to be kind of an iconic and unique thing, as well as the, the god design itself. But design went through a number of iterations. It's the only one that went through so many. It started off with something very different. Actually, not very different. It had hair. It was basically that, like with oh. hair and some clothes and stuff. But we just kind of kept streamlining it the whole way. And it was that god with the eyes for a long time. And then Dershing Helmer on as, as our editor. And she made this really good point about it needing to be more mysterious. And then everything she said immediately felt like the right thing to do. So that's where we ended up with the one here that says Ink to a Shadow. I'm really happy with that. You mentioned earlier how you met Chris. Oh, yeah. Yeah. and how you got part of the project. If you could go into that story a little more. It was kind of one of those things I, I didn't think I'd get anything back from because you see so many writers put a request for artists on Twitter and I was one of those guys who'd answer all of them anytime being so sure that no one's going to reply to me. You know, fucking I'll try anyway. I, I'll always try. I had just turned down and made on a job because I already had another thing green this. I just chased my arm on this anyway and Chris said I needed an artist for a fantasy book and I had just done like two D&D commissions for some mates because it was in the middle of lockdown so I was like taking on whatever commissions I could do you know and I had them at the ready sent them on and like I think Chris put up a tweet like a minute or something and then I was quick to reply and then he replied back and he's kind of saying now that that was it you know job done I found the artist but I was so sure that he wasn't going to reply to me I sent on the four images and the tweet was something ridiculous like shoves portfolio in front of face and flutters eyelashes and ring me I was so positive like what's the matter it's not going to happen anyway you know but it did yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. say whatever I want <laughs> yeah, yeah. maybe that's what I should have been doing the whole time you know yeah, yeah. it's been full on kind of from there then when we discuss the story they kind of say something about the story but like Chris like I think he's like 10 years in the industry and like he's been nominated for an Eisner four times so wow. he has every right to say I'm not listening to you Ben this is your first gig go fuck yourself <laughs> you know? right. but he doesn't he's totally open to any kind of input that I have on the book it's been great I think a few times I've actually been able to like help on things and I have to say the same for himself. The thing like you're really trying to avoid when you're doing character design is that you don't want to make a stereotype. You kind of want to make an archetype, you know, something mm-hmm. a bit more original. And there was one character we came up with who's a big character in issue four. And I had kind of gone down a, a dark city as Ruth without really even thinking about it. And he called me on it. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I'll change that. We'll go another way. That alone kind of set a pace for that brand of people you'll see in, in later mm-hmm. issues. I think it really worked, you know, but it's been easy. You can't say like we've been at loggerheads in that 
any way. It's just been pretty easy going. We understand what's ahead of us and we just kind of get to work on it. You know, and we're not precious about what we have to say to each other. If something doesn't sound quite right or look quite right, we just kind of say to each other and we get it right. Is there anything different you feel you might be doing with your art technique for this? I mean, obviously the difference from animation to now doing a comic, but is there anything you kind of maybe learned or just a certain technique you're using specifically you could think of? There's probably a few things and it's all coming from working in animation. Like, the one big difference is that um, getting to fully finish a drawing, you know, really render it. Whereas when I was storyboarding, it had to be quite loose because a 10 minute episode could have about 800 drawings or a thousand drawings sometimes, depending on what you're doing. So you have to be quite fast, quite loose. Whereas with a comic, you take a bit more time to really massage the rendering. And so there's that. But kind of coming from animation, I'm not taking photos of reference images. I kind of acted out. And so I'd have a video. And oh, okay. I did this because I'm a big Steven Silver fan. Do you guys know who Steven Silver is? Like Kim Possible and stuff. Okay. Really. I know Kim Possible. Like Steven Silver. It's fucking great. And like he has these books that just give you exercise after exercise to really develop a design a certain way. And when you're not hitting the right pose, how to go about hitting the pose and stuff. And like one of the things he kind of says is to get a video because you get a natural pose as opposed to a kind of a, I'm an artist. This is what I think that pose looks like. I'm going to push this pose. And I think it really makes your characters look and feel a bit more genuine about what they're trying to say or what kind of emotion they're pushing in this particular scene or whatever. So like there's a lot of me, you can kind of see in my so you're standing over there by the door recording on this or I have a little gorilla pod for my phone mm -hmm. if I'm working on something that's like a particularly difficult angle to hit because like I think the references really help because I am getting to render the images further but comics is still a tight deadline and I think anything you kind of have to help speed you up you do so having that kind of reference there and spotting the right pose my few seconds of dialogue from a panel or something that I'll never post anywhere because I look and sound like an Egypt that might be one thing that's a little bit different but not a different technique for me so much because I I've been doing it the whole time. I've been getting quite careful about doing it because I remember the first time when I landed my first job in animation, I was working on a show called I'm a Monster and I was trying to draw a director giving out to his staff but the director is a werewolf and he really freaks out and really gets really angry and I remember like holding the script and this is my first job. I really wanted to nail this. I really wanted to impress. I wanted more work out of this. You know, I needed more and I was young and hungry and I was giving it everything and holding the script and I was acting out this director with one hand just giving him all the hands and arms I possibly could and then I heard like this rattling on like my window and I was in an apartment and it was one story up what the fuck is that <laughs> Window. And I realized like the block has a window cleaner and he's just seeing me do this for like the last uh -huh. few minutes. He's just, he's just laughing so hard to see oh. they were me off the window. So now I close my window on blinds and I got that these things out so I don't want my neighbor to think I'm nuts. Oh my That's God. funny. That's awesome. I love the fact that you mentioned like just the overall feeling of what Zanzi is supposed to be or Neth is supposed to be. Neth having her shoulders kind of caved in, smaller character. Zanzi, in every panel she's in, I just feel her like being menacing and strong. Like my favorite is like the rectangular. Those <laughs> panels are my favorite i haven't seen really an artist doing that and i think it's cool to see the motion and what you're getting out of that panel it's so cool kind of it running past totally ripping off any storyboard i've ever done by trying to do the quickest background i possibly could and the time that i have you know but it, it seems to work i don't know how necessary it is in comic books and animation you have to do so many poses and make sense to the video but it's kind of what i know so i'm happy doing that but yeah if anyone's listening and they draw and generally people who want to be in comics who like comics want to be in comics check out steven silver's work because like in terms of how he breaks down poses him and David Coleman and how they break down poses and design it's everything you need to know I'm sure those guys will now pay me a commission for recommending them in all their books that's how <laughs> I'll tag them yeah. don't worry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a big fantasy fan Kyle's a big fantasy fan video games anything that we're kind of watching there's always nods or easter eggs right is there anything hidden in the pages of Godfell that you can tell us about there's a few things I've been trying to put in but I haven't had the opportunity yet like I'd love to put in some characters some other fantasy characters like from quest aside and from barbaric in there you know it'd be nice to see them just kind of in the background somewhere but the body of a god it's not like they can be sitting around in the pub somewhere you know i feel like i'm pushing it as opposed to like having a nice little moment where they could be around in a room somewhere but usually the kind of stuff i put in as easter egg stuff it tends to be <laughs> there's a couple of things on the zombie book i did like i had like my wife and brothers in there and they were beaten up by the big bad guy in there you know oh. <laughs> and my mates have been zombies trying to kill the main characters as well so that, that kind of stuff tell me more friends than that but in animation there's one director I work for and at least once or twice maybe a season I sneak in like Jason into one of the preschool kids shows somewhere in the background no. so, <laughs> <laughs> I think once it's gotten past him to the editor and then the editor had a bit of a laugh as he was putting the boards in that we need to take these out like we can't have these <laughs> in the background somewhere 
<laughs> You're gonna give kids yeah. nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> like, mommy, mommy, mommy being, Jason's like, in my cartoon. <laughs> yeah, I worked on a show called Nelly and Laura. It's like these two little kids playing games with one another. Two sisters, you know. It's a lightning storm, so they're pulling poses when there's a big flash of lightning. Like, they're pulling funny poses, so I was running funny poses. But there was a window behind them, so like every time like they were pulling a pose, there was a big flash of lightning. I make sure I had like Jason in the window, and he's just like, <laughs> "Oh my god, that's great!" <laughs> so obviously, God feels being published for Vault, which Vault mm-hmm. has been doing a ton of cool stuff yeah. and I've been getting more and more into them and like I told you in our first email I had Godfell on my pull list for cool. months now and then when this came to be I'm like wait a minute I recognize this cover I was super excited for this but nice. I wanted you to kind of say your experience with Vault because from what I'm seeing they're a super cool company they're doing some super cool stuff so just I guess your side of things and obviously it's all remote yeah, through yeah, the webcam so I guess a little bit of that so it's been very good because they've all been really good at the parts of the job that they do and there's a team in there doing different things and I don't have to worry about it whereas when I was doing the independent stuff I had to fucking do it all and mm. like it was a job on top of a job on top of a job and then on top of the job that I was doing day to day anyway so to kind of know that I can kind of sit back a bit and know that these guys have it is brilliant you know and they're all so good at it but there's a couple of things like we've had like little conversations and they've been doing these amazing kind of advertising for us by doing little conversations between myself Chris and some of the staff in there and interviewing views and getting same with you guys this kind of stuff I mean none of this could have happened without them you know they've been great but they had a great mind like Damien was also part of all but we did this kind of do you like fantasy do you not like fantasy kind of talk because Chris isn't a big fantasy fan so we were kind of jokingly debating either side of it and like he came out with this great line where he described Godfell as last hobbit on the left and I thought yeah that's fucking brilliant <laughs> I should have had that it's been a lot of fun and it's been a lot of like really good publicizing on things that I haven't really seen a book get pushed like this and they're doing it now with I think like the nasty with John Lee's legend uh, he's, he's one of the best horror writers out there they're doing it with his book now it might just be the way they put books out now which is kind of great because it does get more eyes on the book and why shouldn't books have advertising and ads and gifts made and all those kind of things to, for people to interact with because it makes sense just people like that kind of stuff it engages them more and informs them about it and if it informs them about it then they might actually go buy it and it might be up their street it's been great working with them and we've been lucky and unlucky with the call risks on the book when we started on issue one we had Trina Farr another Irish a friend of mine she's brilliant you know Trina Farr from all your books she's done like she's great but she had to leave near the end of issue two and then we got Vittorio Aston so we were unlucky to say goodbye to her but we were really lucky to get Vittorio on the team because he's brilliant so the art team as well has just been like so good because I'm going to say it now I'm partially colorblind so I don't do a whole lot of coloring so oh. when you get someone like Vittorio and you get someone like Tree on your team I mean they make me look like 10 times the artist I actually am so like it's just a win-win you know working with Chris I mean what can I say like it's been easy it's been fun it's been really interesting it's been kind of impressive to see him get script proofs because when they come in the first take is generally if there's no other edits and we're working on animation when I get a script as a storyboarder I'll see if this is like version 6 or 8 even sometimes you know so that was kind of impressive how the thought just made in one industry and then seeing how it's done in the other has been a bit eye-opening and it's been it's just been fun like I've really enjoyed working on this I've got to do a lot of things I really wanted to do and because I was so long trying to do them I'm really taken in the moment all the attention it's going to get and hopefully will continue to get all well deserved for sure thanks and, uh, hopefully we help it get a little attention too <laughs> yeah I'm sure you will I mean your show is great I and mean, look at the guests you guys get on like, you guys are like a serious numbers I appreciate that I think I'm just annoying and people just say <laughs> are all right we'll give you an hour <laughs> if you ask a lot oh. it, it works eventually yeah <laughs> whatever you're doing is working I'd say keep it up keep annoying people so would you rather live in Middle Earth, Narnia, Westeros, or Karathim? This is a tough one to answer because I think they're all tough places to get by in. Something pretty shit happens in all those places, you know? I think Middle Earth might be the safest if I'm a hobbit. Right? Mm. Those guys tend to get away with a lot, you know, untouched by most things, you know? But, you know, unless those guys really got rid of that thing, eh, they were going to go in for a hard time as well. Unless you're with the witch. And even if you're with the witch, it's a hard time. Uh, I don't like that either. Westeros, I think everyone nice there dies you know I consider myself a nice person I don't want to go there maybe I'm not so much a fan favourite though so maybe my time there could be okay you know maybe Caritham is the best place to go there because I'm sure I can find a little hole somewhere in there and I can avoid all the crazy stuff that's happening around this fallen god 
and I can avoid going to war for one of those factions and I can avoid the Neely that you see on the first couple of pages that you're going to see more of in issue four. Yeah, I'm going to go up my own place. I'm going to make sure I draw a little hovel in there somewhere for me, somewhere online that I know I can be safely existing in, you know, a little farm somewhere. And maybe I'll have drawn in some kind of gun I can use in a fancy world that no one else knows about. So I'm safe. Yeah, I'll go with Karen. But you're creating your own safety. Now would your answer say the same if it was inside the god? <laughs> oh, I'm not going in there. No way. I won't live in there. I might get by for five minutes. Then there's some kind of Hercules maggot tapeworm giving me a hard time. And that design on that thing, I was like, jeez. <laughs> Something about that tapeworm just yeah. hurt my heart a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, good. It was supposed to. <laughs> I emotionally felt for that tapeworm. I was like, go, go tapeworm. I was like, no, all right. Oh, that was it. <laughs> Excellent. That's the goal, right? When people are really emotionally like empathizing with not even a person, the thing in your book, like, yeah, okay, we might be getting somewhere with this. This is good. Yeah, I cried yes. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now the fun part. Pierre, you ready? Name <laughs> that. You got to click quicker. Name that fantasy <laughs> creature, baby. Let's go. Yes. By Panelist Podcast. With hey. fantasy. Beautiful picture, by the way, for everyone <laughs> on YouTube. I really need to get someone to take a proper headshot. It worked properly for the slide. Is that a leprechaun? So it is not. That would have been wrong of me if I tried to do that. I'll give you one more guess. I'm looking Just at like, a small beardy guy with a big not, pointy hat. He's holding something. I can't really, a, a jug or something, is it? A candle. And it's got big brown belts, pointy shoes. So like a, a gnome or something, right? Oh, it is a gnome. Nice. There you go. It is a gnome. Oh, right. Right. Well, it's a great start. Oh, we're going more for species, but if you know the name because it's an actual character, feel free to throw that in for bonus points that don't exist. Okay, cool. Now, if you haven't seen Rings of Power, that is your hint. I haven't seen Rings of Power. Well, you're going to lose points here then. So it's a hobbit, but it's not a hobbit, a harfoot. So am I going like with the guys in general or these particular two? Because that beardy dude with the candle has like a fire advantage. Her hair looks pretty foul. Yeah. Candle lit gnome versus <laughs> pop it. I think she looks like she'd be taller, longer. He looks pretty squat. I think he's got a good double leg takedown. He's going to do <laughs> so full amount and then he's going to get that candle and he's going to light up her hair and he wins. <laughs> All right. It's a little <laughs> darker than I thought this was going to be. <laughs> Probably right. Uh, if you could try and, right? it is a centaur. Now, what about this one? Oh, the scorpion uh, king. Wow. Its species has a name though. No way. I don't know the species name. I didn't either, and I can't pronounce it. Pierre, can you try? I know. What it's is weird. that? <laughs> oh yeah, that's Acura <laughs> Quabella. No, I have no idea how this. I'm gonna go with centaur. I, I think he has the defense and offense advantage, where this guy just has claws, right? They tend to be pretty big. I'd say he's as big as the scorpion king. Remember the scorpion king being pretty big. I haven't seen the film in a while and he's more armored I think he's gonna beat the sun out of the scorpion king he's gonna make that guy look like the poor CGI he really is oh I know this so here we have an eagle that kind yeah, of yeah you the eagles there's a name on him the, what the fuck his name it is I know this there's a few different kind of versions I went with like the most classic of the names a core kind of good word now, so. give you a hint you're not close I'm not close <laughs> it is a griffin yeah I was gonna say it was a character I think it was a griffin but yeah yeah I'm with you okay yeah. we'll give it to you you win no no I lose that one. I'm happy with that one. It's that Cora is something I'm thinking of. But. So the next one is kind of like just a gross version. I wouldn't even know how to describe this. Like yeah, a cat. it's way cooler, right? I, mean, right. Looking at it, I don't know what that thing is, but I think it beats the griffin all day. Just from the blood dripping? I thought that was a manticore. You know, you know what? Knowing what a manticore is? Yeah, it beats the shit out of the fucking griffin all day. Yeah. <laughs> Where is that from? What I'm familiar with is definitely d d It might be in Greek myth as well, but it, yeah, they got a big stinger on their tail. They tend to be kind of an idol that's worshipped by a cult that kind of stuff but they're pretty fucking badass yeah I won't be messing with it so I think just off the fact that you know details about these things I randomly found when I typed fantasy creature into Google uh, pretty good <laughs> that's a tree end right it's got two names and a real name and they are Ents and Ornodrim and then of course it is yes Treebeard Ornodrim oh, didn't know that one before huh? and then versus this guy troll. a new show that I've been meaning to watch it's not as good as that troll hunter that came out a few years ago have you mm. seen that one no I mm. know what you're talking about I never watch it though but it is a good film you'll enjoy it so with experience on both of these creatures the troll wins it's vastly bigger than the tree ant and tree is pretty big and yeah yeah i think the troll is just going to like stomp on it that tree probably comes up to that troll's maybe me oh okay i was not thinking that but that actually makes sense when you look at the background i'll okay. take it i just right. want to add that i thought that was swamp thing <laughs> 
<laughs> that's a troll. <laughs> oh, that's the dragon thing from Game of Thrones, right? The zombie dragon. I yes. called it ice dragon. It was a zombie, that's for sure. And then we have this one. That's small, great from Lord of the Rings. Fantastic. Uh, nice, the nice. Air Drake didn't know that. But which one's winning? I'm gonna go with zombie dragon because it's a zombie, and I think a big part of the dragon fighting style is to bite the shit out of somebody. As soon as a zombie bites you, right, it's game over. Yeah, I'm gonna go with him. Uh, I've seen the ice dragon fight with a fire blast before and it didn't like have any major upper hand so yeah we'll go with the ice dragon i could agree i think smog would just kind of like try and talk to it yeah i think he'd like hide behind his riches his coins and then they'd get frozen yeah. and they'd melt attach into him somehow and then he'd just be having a really bad day rest of life kind of story great answer ah legolas all right oh well definitely will Ferrell wins this all day he drink a big pint of coke and he just burp in legolas's face and legolas would be so upset by how rude he was he'd just leave he'd just go I was just thinking like arrows in the chest of Buddy the Elf, but okay. <laughs> That's probably more realistic, actually, yeah. <laughs> from right. a distance, I guess he'd be out of range of the verb. Yeah, I'm with you. Good answer. So now, you know this one. You know this character, right? I sure do. That's Sanzi. That's our girl from Godfell. And then just how would she do against like these guys? Each one gets absolutely fucking annihilated. <laughs> she already yeah. has like a spearhead through her forearm. There you go. That happens to guy number one. But the rest of them didn't take word and she just runs through them and and you just see blood because their heads are just off their body somehow. He's running on to the next guy. The um, blood is great. Lots of it. Thanks. Uh, Ryan Otley fan. And like having spent so long working in preschool animation, I really went for as much gore as I possibly could do with as much of this book as I could. I'm all for it. And now that you said Ryan Otley, I can kind of see that connection. I'm a oh, fan yeah. of it. That middle panel is exactly what I'm talking about, where I could just see the heads popping off, like her flying nice. through it because of her movement right in that little panel there. It's like, okay, she's flying through these guys. It's like momentum. Feel the momentum. I really felt the heads pop off so kudos it's to you it's nice to use the word pop because do you guys ever play gears of war yeah you hear that pop that's in my head every time zanzi does that, <laughs> that noise you know no. that pop followed by the wet squelch of pissing blood you know right <laughs> right here's some covers for you all fantastic again in stores february 22nd coming up it's soon 100 gonna sell out oh, God, all the covers are so good like i mean i was very happy with my one and then i saw nate good and I'm like oh holy shit that's a cover and then i got colors back on my one from tree tree did the colors on this i'm like holy shit now that's a cover and then we saw all these other kind of covers come in like from Tula Lote here which I can't believe on my first comic book like she's on a cover variant for us like that blows me away to just see like Nathan stuff who's you know he's the artist on Barbaric to do covers for us like, and he does them the whole way through because all the B covers they're all brilliant like it's just been really cool seeing all these artist variations of Zanzi as well because that's kind of one of the reasons why I was so tight on the model sheets I wanted these guys to know exactly what it is they had to draw mm -hmm. and it's great to see where they deviated and what they pushed and what they didn't push so we have sky partridge here and like a heather they're just all so different but they all do that job of i think catching your eye on the shelf which is the whole purpose of the cover right it's not mm -hmm. just about doing a really nice image it's about doing something to stand out from the comics next to it and each one like does that by giving like so much color to one particular part of a page or a really big loud color it's mad seeing my name on those artists work when i've seen them do variants for barbaric and stuff and there's maria wolf's one back that was on the last one so I'll come in like she's brilliant like yeah that's another big loud cover like that even stands out from everything else on it and the other cover on this might her cover is just pop and then we have the promo images here from Tim the middle top one that's actually part of the cover of issue 2 on the other side you get to see the bad guy that comes up in issue 2 who you're all going to see a lot more of I can't wait till people see him like uh, we had a conversation about not really having a bad guy we kind of wanted a crowd and all the actions in the body to be the bad guy but then Mavernus came up uh, Chris came up with this guy after a bit of a chat with Adrian and Adrian's been great he's been kind of guiding us along the way if we were kind of losing sight on some aspects of the book he would kind of hey you know what you kind of need one of these things or you'd maybe do that as well or, or this is what your book is actually also about he's been brilliant and he made a call on us needing a bad guy and after our conversation we both said we don't really want a big bad guy we just kind of want like he'll be a face of the bad guys for a spell but then we actually delivered I think on what is one of the most fun bad guys I've seen in a long time and he's hiding behind the word God fell there and then we have one of the pages at the bottom middle I have the book where Zanzi and Neth first see the god for the first time and you see mining towers around the god's body you see a little door there at the who 
poof of the god. We see some rat pigeons flying around there too. Did, did you have a favorite out of all of them? I kind of changed my mind on this a lot. I don't know if I have a favorite. As a cover, right, when you're trying to make sure you catch everyone's eye on everything, I think Nathan's might do that better than anyone else's. Like those colors, that pose, it's right in the middle. There's more prominence for that glowy yellow he has that I think will stand out a lot. And when I saw him do that, when I saw Trina send in the colors on the cover for issue two, I thought, oh, yellow. If we use lots of yellow, we'll stand out a lot. So that's why you see yellow on issue three. We use yellow again on issue four with Vittorio. And Vittorio colored issue three as well. We've just decided now yellow is going to be a theme until the end. We're going to try to use yellow. It really pops. You kind of see guys like use like a single color a lot. Like I think Scotty Young is really good at it. He uses just white a lot. And uh, it does stand out off everything else around it. And you see if there's lots of characters doing lots of different things and a big building behind them, there's lots of stuff going on. Your eye doesn't really get to settle somewhere. That's what I kind of took from Nate's variant on issue one. And then I threw it onto issue three here as much as I could do where you see just a yellow background. Neth is looking at a blood pool, but he's not reflected in the blood pool. It's a version of Neth banging against the blood, kind of saying, you know, stop this. Mm -hmm. But this Neth has her hands in the blood and there's parts of her floating up into the ether. Like she's kind of losing herself the more she kind of keeps this blood on her hands and you, you kind of find out like what is going on with Neth. Like to get that kind of bit abstract kind of helps the cover as well. I think if you're on a staples at all time and she's like a fucking cover hero, an artist hero in general, she's brilliant, she can't do wrong. So we're kind of looking at I think what she did and what Nathan did on that B cover kind of really got me thinking going forward. So I'm probably going to go with Nathan. Which one's your least favorite? <laughs> Can you imagine I just answered that like straight away? <laughs> Without blinking, you're like, oh yeah, it's this one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one final plug for the book. So Godfell is out the 22nd of February. Please put it on your pull list. Please put it on your local comic book show and buy it. You guys are all familiar with Christopher Sabella and you all know he does great work, but you don't know me. You've never heard of me, but I think if you take a chance on a Christopher Sabella book with me, you're going to not be disappointed. I think I do a good job working with Chris on this. We both produced a book that we're both happy to stand beside and say, yeah, we did that. And I think us being our own work editors if we're happy to do that this is a book you're probably going to like and if you're a fantasy fan I think you're really going to like it so please go out and check the book and if you're in Dublin Saturday the 25th at 5 o'clock I'll be in The Big Bang in Dundrum and I'll sign whatever you put in front of me doesn't even have to be my book I have a couple of giveaways I'm going to do like kind of like what you guys did actually with the slideshow and I'm going to do like a little game with people who come in if you answer a question at my table on the day you'll get the golden ticket the golden ticket is a portfolio review from me that we'll do Zoom at a time that suits us both. I'm going to do whatever I can to bring people into the shop. And the other two things and I have a sketch of Zanzi and I have a sketch of Neth. And uh, again, if you answer the question, you'll get it. I've seen like throwing them into an issue, but I think I've seen people do that before. And then I've also seen like people go home and get them, oh look, I got the sketch. I didn't realize. I'd like to be there with the person and give them the sketch on the day. So they're not going to be tricky. You know, they're going to be pretty easy. You just got to tell me which sketch you're looking for. I'll give you the question for that sketch. You can only get one sketch, but you can get a sketch and you can try to get the golden ticket as well. I'm How much are tickets to Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> Flights can't be that expensive. Let's and Dublin's one of the cheapest places to ever live in. No. <laughs> <It's not. laughs> oh man do you have any other projects you'd like to mention anything you're working on that maybe you could hint at the podcast the honest pod please check us out we have an episode after every episode of the hbo the last of us and on a thursday where we take a guest in to talk about their favorite apocalypse but we'll just have had two horror writers i mentioned john he's from the nasty he's actually just been on the show his episode was last week this week we have another horror writer peter Dunn of the petrified podcast do you guys listen to that no might be up your street it's like a good kind of horror ontology okay oh nice yeah we'll have that and then like there's also the book the odds that'll be out near the end of this year cool so that being said where can everyone follow you oh you can find me on just about every social platform as benesey that's b-e-n-n-e-s-s-y that's like a kind of like the cognac but with a b instead of a h ben hennessy everybody godfell makes you pick it up this honestly is a 10 for me like i adore this book it is fantastic so if i'm saying it's good i mean means it's good you're no. gonna get a 10 from me too 10 platypus oxen uh, a 10 out of 10 that's, that's great thanks for having me guys
Are we skipping the quick like Pilates class we were going to do together? Or yes, that? yes, no. We're skipping that. Huh? No, no exercise right now. It's going to get warmed up and everything, guys. Right. <laughs> Pal Lights Podcast. Sorry, can I swear on this? Is that oh, right? yeah, go oh, for it. Awesome. It's all up to you. If you want us to edit it out, he'll edit it out. You, you'll sound PG the whole time. <laughs> just, all I'll do is I'll deliberately swear the whole time. So it'll just be on that beat from beginning to end. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great for TikTok, actually. Pal Lights Podcast. That was the only question I wanted to really, really ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was a good answer. Though. He butchered it completely. Like you should have seen it. Like, we got it out. We got it out. Panelites podcast. I don't know what you call them. Panels. But what do you call them? Panels. Panels. Let's go. <laughs> Panelites podcast. There you go. Uh, you get it, you get it now? <laughs> so it's all making sense. But those panelites podcast. I think you should put that in one of the pages so we can catch it. It's like, oh look, you see that little farm in the distance? He's living right there. Yeah, yeah. it's gonna be there. You'll see it. Panelites podcast. There's there's really no you losing in this and there's really no winning in this either i mean no i just say i win and i'm happy everyone is good yeah. you know? i mean if you really lose then that's just gonna be embarrassing so <laughs> we'll make sure you win